hello, um, my name is Alex Pan. Um, I'm an associate director at the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship based out of Santa Clara University. Um, so really excited to, to be here today and to have all of you join. Um, today we're going to be talking about how recoverable grants can be used to support social enterprises in the missing middle. Um, and so, you know, I always think of impact investing as a, a big tent word um, and there is a spectrum um, of impact investing. Um, everything from uh, philanthropy, at the, the negative 100% return, um, to the market rate returns on, on the other. Um, and I've always felt like, uh, over the last few years that the conversation in the impact investing field has really focused on um, the between market rate return and concessionary uh, returns. So are you trying to target 20% IRR or are you targeting something around, you know, three to 5% IRR? Um, however, that debate has left out a whole other side of the spectrum. Um, everything from above pure philanthropy, so above um, negative 100% ROI, all the way up to that return of capital point at 0% ROI. And that really hasn't been um, explored in much depth, or at least explored in a way that I have, have learned much about. Um, and so we really feel like that, that side of the spectrum between negative 99% ROI um, and 0% ROI have, have a tremendous potential um, to unlock capital and, and support social enterprises to scale um, and some other impact. Um, and so, you know, I won't pretend like this is a, a discovery that, that I made kind of sitting in an armchair or sitting in a, um, a session here at SOCA. Um, you know, like, like all great inventions, um, necessity was really the, the mother of invention here. Um, and in this case, the COVID crisis um, kind of provided that necessity for, for us. Um, and so we were, were seeing that, that in this COVID crisis, there was a need for, for innovation um, and a need for, for untraditional um, fund structures. Um, and so what we're gonna do today is explain a little bit about um, the genesis of, of this concept and how we piloted this concept through what we are calling the trust fund, um, which is a uh, emergency facility uh, that Miller Center and with, with uh, Ted at Beneficial Returns uh, put together. Um, and so we're gonna explain a little bit about the genesis of that fund, how it's structured, um, and some of the early results of that fund. Um, but then what we're gonna do is really explore how a similar structure and how using recoverable grants and, and other kind of impact investing funds can support social enterprises in the missing middle and, and unlock capital for, for a segment of social enterprises that has been overlooked by the impact investing community at large. Um, so uh, that's enough uh, of me at the moment. Um, looks like we have Catherine here. And Catherine, I'm, I'm unaware of who you are. <laughs> Um, if it's all right with you, Catherine, I'm going to move you back to, I, I don't actually know how to do that, but let's just mute you for now, but thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm going to um, turn to introductions and and um, have Ted and, and Monker introduce themselves. Um, so Monker, I'm going to start with you. If you could just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, you know, who you are and what representing um, and then a little bit about your involvement with um, the trust fund as well. Um, Monica, can we go to you? Why don't I introduce myself and then we'll go back to Monica afterwards. And Alex, Great. you may Great. find Ben um, in the participants possibly, and we'll have to Great. figure out how to unmute him right. if that's the case. Uh, my name is Ted Levinson. I'm the founder and CEO of an impact investing fund called Beneficial Returns. What we do is we borrow money from family foundations, donor advised funds, and faith-based communities. We pool that money and we make long-term equipment loans to social enterprises addressing poverty in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Uh, 
uh, our borrowers include, uh, I think it's four or possibly five graduates of the GSBI program at Santa Clara University. And uh, uh, historically, our investors have earned a very low return, 2% annually. Uh, we recently changed that model so that our participants, our bar, uh, investors now earn a 0% uh, a return through recoverable grants. We are uh, running the trust fund, which, uh, which is the subject that we're discussing today, an emergency loan fund for Miller Center grads. Over to you, Malka. Thanks, Ted. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Manka Anguafo, and I am the founder and CEO of Grassland Cameroon. Um, Grassland Cameroon is a food storage, drying, and distribution company based in Cameroon in West Central Africa. Um, we source products, mostly food products, food staples, from smallholder farmers that we support with input loans, training, and farm monitoring services throughout the season. Um, so that they can be more productive. Over the past four years, we've supported just over a thousand corn farmers who've seen their yields double from under two tons to almost five tons per hectare. And as a result, they've had their incomes triple over time. Thanks, Manka. That was a great introduction. Um, and I have found Ben in the uh, in the the chat here, and David has just joined as well. Um, ben, if you check your chat, you probably oh, should have the invitation to join as a panelist. Um, Would you unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Wanjao. I'm uh, the CEO and founder of DivaBits Green Energy, which is a social enterprise based in Kenya, where we distribute uh, solar products to the off-grid rural communities. And I'm very excited about this new opportunity about recoverable grants and I'm here to share more about uh, the new future for addressing the, you know, the, you know, the missing middle gap for financing. Thank you, David. Um, well, great. As, as uh, Ben, hopefully you can find in your chat, I just invited you to join as a, a panelist. Um, so let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, Monica, I want to start with you. Um, like I said, you know, necessity was kind of the, the mother of invention here. So I'm wondering if you can tell the audience a little bit about how the COVID crisis was impacting you um, and what your, your capital needs were, were at the time in order to kind of keep the impact that you were having on track. Uh, Monica, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me, Ted, David? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Monica, can you hear me? Ted, can you try in if Monica can hear you? Monica, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I, I think I can hear everyone except Alex right now. Okay. Um, okay, so in that case, um, Will you explain how COVID was affecting your business uh, before you applied to the trust fund for a loan? Yeah, so our business is a high inventory business, as you can imagine, because we push out um, asset-based debt to farmers at the start of the season. So we actually have to buy a bunch of farm inputs like fertilizer, seeds, and so forth. Um, and then at the end of the season, we also um, have a huge demand for, for money because we're um, getting paid back in, in, in grain at harvest. And then we buy the remainder of our farmer's grain as well. Um, so when COVID made, it its, way, made its way to, to Cameroon, um, we, we had already purchased all of our farm inputs. And at that time, we were planning to distribute to twice as many farmers as we had the previous season. Um, so we had all our cash or majority of our cash was already um, in our farm in inventory. Um, and we had started to see with the lockdowns that were implemented um, across the nation, we had started to see sales or demand for our product uh, decline in the two main market segments that we serve, the severe industry and the uh, 
the animal feed industry. Um, so we had a cash problem um, and we weren't sure, in fact, we were positive that there was no way to easily convert the money that we had in inventory that is in the fertilizers and the seeds um, to cash because no one else uh, who was serious about farming hadn't already purchased what they needed. Um, and we weren't able to convert our existing inventory in, in actual uh, products to sell into cash as well. So the trust fund um, was very timely because it, it gave us an opportunity when we applied um, to, to get cash as soon as we could. Um, we could have probably tried to find money elsewhere, but we had, we were facing three main challenges, which would have made getting money from any other source really difficult. The first was that, um, the stage of our business, um, is still quite early. We, we hadn't had any institutional investor who would have been able to double down on their investment. Um, then our market, the market that we serve um, in Cameroon, unfortunately, for various reasons, is uh, part of uh, Francophone Africa that doesn't have a very strong uh, investment ecosystem. Um, and so potential investors uh, don't necessarily have a lot of information or, a, uh, or other partners that they can rely on for, for co-investing. Um, and then third, our sector, agriculture in Africa in general, is very high risk um, because the bulk of farming is done by uh, smallholder farmers that are vulnerable uh, and aren't known to respect contract agreements and production in general, the cost of production aren't as competitive as imports. So we had these challenges um, as well as the, the very urgent need for cash. Thanks, Monica. Um... Not sure if you can hear me, so I'm going to give you the thumbs up. Um, so, Ted, let's let's turn to you. Um, can I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's turn to you, Ted. Um, so, back back in February of this year, you and I were, were both hearing a lot of stories like Monka's of urgent need for for cash in order to kind of keep their, their impact on track. Um, and we we both felt compelled um, that we needed to to kind of do something here. Um, but we also knew that a traditional debt fund was, was going to be inappropriate to, to serve in the needs of, of entrepreneurs like Monaco. So I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about why innovation was necessary here and, and tell us a little bit about the structure that, that you came up with to kind of provide capital in a crisis like this. Absolutely. So, um, you know, in late February, it, it was clear to us that the virus was going to be far more damaging to social enterprises than we had previously thought. But um, but we also didn't have any clarity around how long it would last. I would argue we still don't know that now. So um, we knew that we needed to act quickly because um, a lot of these social enterprises, including ones that, that might be as old as a decade, were really at risk of going out of business very quickly uh, if they couldn't get access to capital. But it was also very clear to us that this was these were going to be very high risk loans. Uh, we were making emergency loans actually, you know, actually looking for, for borrowers that were in trouble. Uh, we knew that these borrowers would not be able to pay uh, a high interest rate if we were able to make a loan to them. We also knew that they would uh, require a very generous grace period. Uh, many of the countries where these social enterprises operate were under very serious lockdowns. And so um, what became clear is that there was a, a, a desperate need for capital to keep these social enterprises alive. And there's no way that it would be able to pay investors a, an appropriate return considering the risks they were taking. It was also clear that um, a company like Beneficial Returns wouldn't be able to earn um, even a, a modest amount of money for the, for the effort involved in it. Um, and yet simultaneously, it seemed that uh, grants to these social enterprises weren't the solution um, really for two reasons. One, it would be difficult to raise a large amount of grant money quickly. And two, it wasn't necessarily necessary. Um, it was, uh, you know, it would be possible that many of these social enterprises would recover and would be able to repay a loan. So a grant didn't seem like the right option either. Uh, 
that's why we partnered with Miller Center and in a matter of just a few weeks uh, raised over $750,000 in the form of recoverable grants from about 10 impact investors. Uh, these impact investors use, use their donor advised funds or their family foundations to make uh, these grants. And just to give you a little background, uh, recoverable grants have existed since the 1960s. Uh, as far as the IRS is concerned, and as far as GAAP accounting is concerned, these are grants. Uh, every donor advised fund sponsor in America, Fidelity Charitable, Schwab Charitable, Vanguard, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, they all are experienced making recoverable grants. And uh, it, it's money out of the donor's account, treated just like a grant, counting towards a 5% distribution if you're a family foundation, not to get too technical. And uh, in the event that that money is repaid, it returns to the corpus of the foundation or the donor advised fund and needs to be given out uh, in the following year. And so by bringing in money in the form of recoverable grants, uh, we were able to offer very low cost capital to our borrowers, 2% uh, uh, annual interest rate with a six month uh, payment holiday uh, because our investors through their recoverable grants were the ones that are ultimately taking the risk of default. Um, so since we started, we've lent, uh, we've made loans to 11 borrowers totaling a little over $800,000. We were able to lend more money than we raised because one of our borrowers has already repaid us, permitting us to recycle that capital. And by working very closely with Miller Center and its network of mentors, uh, we were able to very quickly approve transactions and get money out of the door. Um, there was a while there where we were approving and funding uh, one transaction per week. Uh, that pace has slowed down a little bit and uh, we have enough capital to make one last loan. Alex, you're on mute. Alex, you're on mute. Alex, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Um, great, thank you. Um, so great summary, Ted. Um, David, I wanna turn to you. Um, you know, having received investment from the trust fund, I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on, you know, some of the, how some of the innovations that, that Ted mentioned have have manifested themselves kind of in your experience with the fund? What are some of the differentiating factors um, that, that allow trust fund uh, to support you and you know, what else were you seeing at, at, at the time? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of uh, innovation has been put into place uh, developing the trust fund. And uh, I feel the trust fund uh, model uh, is kind of, you know, a bridge between, you know, normal, you know, grants and normal debt. And one of the things that from my experience during the COVID-19 pandemic is that, you know, we had a lot of conversation with different investors and, you know, this, you know, the talks became a little bit slower. And, you know, this is because, you know, you know, everybody don't want, you know, nobody wants to risk investments during such times. But however, you know, you know, with the trust fund, you know, coming in, we were able actually to have very smooth conversations. Um, you know, the documentation needed for the loans uh, were very actually easy to develop. And that makes it easier for a lot of entrepreneurs, especially running social enterprises. And this is where a lot of, you know, gap happens because sometimes we may not have the right uh, you know, capacities. We may not have a CFO in-house and, you know, also the, you know, a lengthy documentation also limits a lot of smaller social enterprises to actually access. So the trust fund was a little bit different. And uh, this is because the documentation needed was a little bit, uh, you know, few documents. And I, you know, I would actually, you know, say that, you know, the innovation also was tied that, you know, they're actually looking for, you know, enterprises that have gone through an, you know, an accelerator program, which was uh, through Miller Center GSPA program. 
and that makes it easy because really these you know these companies have been tested have been you know provided mentorship and the only thing they are lacking you know you know for growth is capital and you know so that process was a little bit easier for us and became one of the sweet you know swiftest uh, process that we have gone through in funding uh, in fact we were able to raise funds within a month you know like it was unbelievable as a team and it was really came in very handy when we were up almost you know you know slowing down all our processes and and in having the the trust fund come in was able to stimulate a lot of other conversations that were pending with investors so i'd actually say it actually you know acted as a boost and and gave a lot of other investors confidence to actually put money into us and uh, the other thing that was really interesting for us is that is the low interest that uh, trust fund was asking for is like you know would they even make money from that but I think this is from the you know the vision where they want actually to create more impact than just uh, normal returns, and that was a really cool thing for us at such a times of pandemic when everybody was running away from us, and you know through the trust fund investments we have you know we have been able to actually stay afloat during that period for two months, and that allowed you know more investment to actually have time to come in. And, and now we are very excited that we've been able to close more funds after the trust fund. So it was also, um, I'd call it, you know, it actually accelerated, you know, processes with other investors. So it uh, was a really timely one. Um, and then the other thing is that it's very odd when, you know, a lot of uh, investors are looking for what you call unicorn businesses, models, uh, businesses that can actually scale up in, you know, several countries. And most often is that, you know, solid businesses uh, like Diverbits and, and, and other social enterprises get neglected, you know, and they, you know, we are probably the zebras, you know, we, you know, we are probably be profitable, operational certain, you know, scale and create impact in our own way. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times, a lot of bigger investors are avoided. So I found it really interesting that we can have uh, a fund that actually supports uh, the, not the unicorns, but also, you know, solid businesses that are actually doing a lot of impact in the community. And I'd actually say that it was a very friendly, you know, conversation. So to me, uh, I feel that Trust Fund is changing the way um, investment is being done you know a lot of times is that you actually fear investors you know you know you know things they're asking for uh, targets you know a lot of documentation of financial models and you know that we tend to shy away you know i think with us trust fund we actually you know had to provide uh, a cash flow projection of, of how we you know we're anticipating our cash and where we're going to ha be having gaps so it was a very friendly conversation and i love the process uh, and i those are, you know, the key things I would actually say the process was uh, very swift and, you know, and the people, the investors were really friendly to us. David, do you love the process or do you love the outcome? <laughs> you can say both. Um, <laughs> David, so a lot of really great points there. You know, one, um, it's a type of capital that funds this the zebra um, movement, as, as you put it, you know, social enterprises that are solid, that are growing steadily, but aren't going to have you know, the, unicorn, the unicorn hockey stick. Um, you know, to the, the fact that, um, that it was able to, to move quickly and, and you know, provide limited, um, limited diligence because of its part with with the Miller Center and kind of the vetting that the Miller Center is able to offer to um, its investment partners. Um, and three, you know, the, the beneficial uh, terms of the loan um, also allowed you to you know, uh, get leverage um, and signal to other investors that that you um, were a, a kind of a, a worthwhile cause supporting. And, and so you're, you know, the trust funds investment was able to create leverage by by catalyzing kind of other investors as well. Um, so so thanks for thanks for hitting on all those those points. Um, ben, I want to turn to you and, and Ben, welcome. Sorry, <laughs> we had some, some difficulty getting you um, in this morning. Um, so for everyone's uh, edification, Ben um, is a mentor with the Miller Center and also one of the um, 
the funders of or the investors into the, the trust fund. Um, and so, so, you know, everything we've been talking about so far, Ben, uh, makes a lot of sense from the entrepreneurs perspective, right? So of course, um, you know, low rates and moving quickly is, is good for them. Um, but you know, why would any investor in their right mind want to put money into a fund that is promising them a negative return? Um, and so I guess my question to you is one, are you in your right mind? Um, but then two, you know, what, what aspect of, of your kind of investment portfolio did this represent and, and why did you decide to make an investment in your trust? Yeah. And can, thank you, Alex. And first, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me give a little bit of background on myself just to set some context for the answer to that question, Alex. Uh, so I spent my career as in the 1990s, I was an advisor working with companies at an investment bank, working with entrepreneurial companies, helping them grow and access capital and do mergers and acquisitions. So I was an advisor in the fundraising process. And then in around 2002, for about 14 years, I became a principal investor. So I started, I worked at a private equity firm. I was a partner helping invest in entrepreneurial companies that are trying to grow and build their business. Uh, and I did that for about a dozen years. And then I switched to um, just managing with my family office and set up a foundation and, and focus a little more on philanthropy and my own private investing. So I retired uh, about six years ago from the private equity business. So my whole career was around profit seeking <laughs> and investing. Um, and, and then as, as I retired, I shifted towards the philanthropic side. And when you think about the answer to your question, Alex, why uh, this type of of investing or, or vehicle and what the trust fund is doing as Ted described it is so compelling is anyone who's interested in uh, having an impact with the, whether if they're a foundation or a private investor they're they're going to look at social entrepreneurship if, if they're interested in supporting social entrepreneurs they're going to be somewhere on the spectrum right they're going to be on uh, the far left I'll say of the spectrum you, you might be someone who's purely seeking market rate returns with their capital but wants to have an impact, so they're going to focus the capital on social entrepreneurs and, and, and businesses that can have an impact um, and be self-sustaining, but earn a market return. At the other end of the spectrum might be pure, a pure grant, a, a philanthropic organization, a foundation, or a high net worth individual who wants to support um, uh, social entrepreneurs with the idea that it's a grant and there's nothing coming back. You're giving. And there, so on that end of the spectrum, you've got maximum impact and no return. On the other end, you've got a market return and you want to have some impact. What the trust fund and, and, and this type of investing allows is for both of those, anyone on either end or anywhere on that spectrum to improve impact. And, and so they, the ability to commit uh, a dollar to a social entrepreneur and know that you're going to get something back, 94 cents, 80 cents, 60 cents, depending on the success ultimately of uh, the entrepreneurs and, and the orientation of the, the fund. But let's say you get 80 cents back over a period of a few years. It's, you know, it's a money losing event. But then you reinvest that 80 cents and you get 80% of that back. So you get 64 cents back and you keep doing that. Over 10 years, your dollar will have had twice as much impact because it will have been used by multiple uh, social entrepreneurs. And it will have, so you can take if I'm in a mode of granting to have an impact, I can actually increase my impact through a trust fund by getting leverage on the dollar, allowing the dollar to be reinvested in multiple entrepreneurs over time. So with a finite amount or limited amount of uh, foundation capital, I can actually double or triple the impact depending on what the return over time. So that's interesting to someone who's got a really an impact orientation and foundation as an alternative to a grant because it can have bigger impact. For someone who has a market rate of return goal, it actually allows them to, you know, if you think about the world of social entrepreneurs, which is large, the portion that actually will earn a market rate of return acceptable to a, you know, a, a, someone who's used to venture investing or growth equity investing is going to be a small part of the universe. In, and, and they're going to have a limited amount of impact with that part of the universe. For that person, they're able to move a little bit towards higher impact. And, and take if they're if they're willing to give up some of that return and move towards the grant side, but with knowing that they're not going to 
that their, their capital is not going to, you know, is not being used entirely in the first social entrepreneur. So they're also able to move towards a higher impact. So for both either end of the spectrum, on the one hand, you're able to put you're able to put your dollars to work at a higher uh, with a multiplier effect that is interesting as a way to get to have more impact to touch more entrepreneurs. That's one aspect. The other aspect is it allows you to think about a broader risk profile. So to impact a broader set of social entrepreneurs with a broader set of business profiles and market risk profiles, because you're, you're not governed by the same risk requirements you would have if you were uh, seeking a market return. So you can broaden your risk profile and have bigger impact. Um, and then especially as we heard on the, the call today, in moments of crisis, that broadening of impact, it's nice in a normalized, normal environment to be able to have impact on more, a broader set of entrepreneurs solving a broader set of problems because your risk profile is not, is, you don't, you're able to take more risk than a, a market, someone seeking a market return. In a moment of crisis or period of crisis, it actually allows that, that reduced risk profile, allows you to have more impact on, uh, on entrepreneurs in a much lower friction, um, you know, higher, uh, velocity way than you could if you were absolutely trying to go through a, a, a full, trying to earn a market return and do the full market due diligence and really uh, make sure you're trying to preserve or, or, or eliminate any risk of loss of capital. So for an investor or for a philanthropist, it just allows you to do more, have more impact and put, make your dollars work, uh, have, a, have a bigger dollar impact, but also serve a broader set of the social entrepreneur community. That makes sense. Absolutely, well, it does to me. Hopefully, it makes sense to that. <laughs> maybe, the, maybe um, it would be helpful for our participants for me to share very briefly the economics for investors and the economics for the borrowers, and then also answer some of the chat questions. So, our inv our borrowers receive all the, all of them receive loans at a two percent interest rate. They all have six months of grace period with no payments. And then we expect them to repay the loan uh, over the following 18 months. Uh, so at the end of the term, they've repaid us in full at 2%. Our investors, on the other hand, are participating, knowing that they're not going to make any money. And in fact, knowing that they're going to lose at least a little money. So beneficial returns charges an annual 2% management fee um, over a three year period. So best case scenario, all of the borrowers repay and our investors wind up uh, losing 6%, uh, which by the way, not so shabby if you can make, you know, make a grant that only amounts to 6% and manage to keep a lot of social enterprises alive. It's an incredibly efficient form of grant making. Um, in the event that we do experience any loan losses, and considering the types of loans we're making and the environment that we're making, we do expect that that will happen. Somebody's going to go out of business. Uh, in that case, all of our investors will share pro rata in the losses. So to take an extreme example, and Ben, I promise you this isn't going to happen, but if nobody pays us back, then our investors lose all of their money. Uh, but, um, but you know, we expect that the vast majority of the, of the loans that we made will uh, will be paid back in full. And consequently, we expect to be returning almost all of the money um, to our investors. Um, some of the questions that came up in the chat, um, I mentioned that from gap accounting, when you make a recoverable grant, it's considered a grant, um, but the recipient considers it a loan on their own books. And uh, there's no reason why a recoverable grant couldn't include an interest rate return, but really, we're focused on the zero to negative 99% because there's, you know, as Ben said, there's this huge gap. Why is it that there's so many organizations that we think are deserving of a grant, negative 100% return? And yet we, we don't look at anything between zero and negative 99. And then we just start looking into the positive column again. And there's so many things that we could accomplish if impact investors would open their minds to this idea of earning less than 0%. Um, so many great organizations like Monka's and David's could be supported during emergency moments and uh, smaller, younger, riskier social enterprises could be supported during normal times. So there's a huge, huge opportunity here 
to use recoverable grants for impact investors. And I want to remind everyone, a successful impact investment, or really a successful investment, is not one that returns a high financial return. It's one that meets your expectations, whatever those might be. And so we're, we're very fortunate that we found impact investors who uh, their expectations are fast loans with deep impact to game-changing social enterprises and uh, getting most of their money back. And so by be, uh, since we were able to match, find investors with that um, risk appetite and return appetite, we were able to make the trust fund work. And there's no way we could have uh, done what we did otherwise. So thanks, Ted. And thanks for hitting, I think, a lot of the questions that came in in the chat. Um, I think that's a, a good segue to, you know, what is next um, for, you know, either the trust fund as, as a fund itself or, in your opinion, um, the future of kind of recoverable grants in the impact investing space. Um, what what kind of market segment does this represent? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what we're doing. So we have used the same model to launch uh, what's called the reciprocity fund, which is a fund making loans to social enterprises serving indigenous communities in Latin America and Southeast Asia, an inherently high risk, low dollar, um, difficult to identify and, and lend to market. Uh, we are uh, deep in discussions about launching Trust Fund 2.0, which will move us from an emergency loan fund to recovery grants. And uh, ben this is how Beneficial Returns itself um, raises money from, from our investor community. I think there's so much opportunity. I could see this uh, being applied to uh, social enterprises serving refugees, which oftentimes are small and risky organizations. I could see this going into very challenging geographies. Uh, I would add, I would say uh, Nicaragua and maybe the DRC today. There's just tremendous opportunity um, to be using this model to make, uh, to make loans to social enterprises uh, where it's just um, not reasonable to expect a, a financial return to the investors. Or more importantly, where um, if you wanted to earn a, a financial return, you would have to avoid working with some of the most promising and exciting and interesting and high impact social enterprises. Investors really have great control over, over the outcomes that they seek, right? If people are looking for market rate returns, guess what? You're gonna get the market that we already have. Social enterprises are about moving the market and doing things, using business to make things happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. And we need impact investors to adopt that same mentality and to use finance to make things happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. Thanks, Ted. Um, and so, Maka, I want to turn to you from, from your kind of experience as one of these social entrepreneurs. How would more funding um, like, you know, trust fund, but, uh, you know, impact investing supported by recoverable grants, um, what would that enable for you? Um, and, and how does that compare to what you're currently seeing in the ecosystem? Yeah, um, first of all, what the trust fund has done this year is incredible. Um, I know that I, I had accidentally muted you before, Alex, so I probably didn't hear what you said. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, but for for us, what it's done and the time frame, as David already said, um, not being bogged down by a ton of due diligence process was really a game changer because you need the money yesterday and you need someone that actually, regardless of um, what the roadblocks are in, in your financial structure or your political operating in, is willing to get, get the money to you. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to more of these sort of um, financing mechanisms. I think that for us, the trust fund has probably been uh, the first fund that has invested in us from the US. Or no, they, they partnered, they co-invested with someone else. 
Um, there are very few funds in, in our space completely um, outside of IEP um, because of the historical ties that Francophone Africa has with France and also just the, the levels of red tape that exist in the market that we're in. Um, so I'm hoping that as more models um, emerge, more innovative models um, and recoverable grant models emerge, um, we can actually benefit from that and scale our business to, you know, 5,000 farmers processing more grain in our post-harvest uh, conditioning facility um, and hopefully scale beyond this country. So it's really, it's really been a huge, huge, huge um, uh, breath of fresh air um, and also a, a good signal because thanks to what Trust Fund did with us, now we're having conversations with INP um, because as David said, a lot of investors um, are always going to be reluctant to be the first one to come in. Um, and since there's so few in our space, uh, Trust Fund has really unlocked a lot of um, other people to come in to, to give us a seat at the table. Thanks, Marco. And Ted, I actually want to see if you can expand upon a point that, that Marco made there. Um, you know, why have you been able to make loans in, you know, uh, Cameroon from your, your desk in Portland? How did the, um, the relationship, I guess, with Miller Center enable some of that, that speed of, of diligence? So we, we could have done it without Miller Center. It just wouldn't have gone very well. So, um, what what we did it by limiting ourselves and by to Miller Center grads and by partnering with Miller Center, we were able to conduct a level of due diligence remotely that that we never could have done otherwise. And so all of these uh, uh, social enterprises, of course, were vetted by Miller Center before they even went through their accelerator program, and then uh, were observed and uh, during, during the acceleration process. And uh, Miller Centers continued to, to follow up with these social enterprises afterwards. So they had a great deal of insight into which ones were the big, which ones were the winners, which ones were, were maybe less so, uh, which ones were the jokers. And so it was, um, it was extremely valuable for us to be able to reach out to the Miller Center uh, uh, staff and especially the mentors to get their insight into um, into the business model, into the entrepreneurs themselves, into what uh, some businesses were lacking and to identify potential risks. And that helped us make uh, certainly quick decisions, and I also think that helped us make um, strong decisions. Uh, we'll, we'll find out soon as our borrowers um, are obliged to start repaying us, um, but um, that insight that we had is something rare for an impact investor to have access to, and I don't think we could have ever made uh, these loans in a responsible way without having uh, that network that we could tap. Thanks, Ted. Um, David, I want to go to you too. Um, you know, can you comment on on what what greater prevalence of this type of financial instrument would it, would enable for you, and, and how this differs from your your previous experience? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, in our line of business in uh, solar distribution, we we're using one special technology or innovation, which is called pay as you go. And you know, pay as you go, it means that you have to pay the supplier first, and then you, you have to receive money over a period of time from the customers, maybe you know, in eight to 10 months. So historically, we have had a lot of challenge in terms of working capital needs. And despite the, you know, each, each of the sales we are doing having very solid uh, profits, but the profit comes with it. So the cash flow, you know, you know, there's a cash flow gap at the, you know, because of our model. And, you know, it has been very hard, especially at our youthfulness or very early stage as an organization to actually be able to, you know, you know, acquire, you know, serious debt. You know, most of the people would actually need us to have certain collaterals. And we didn't have collaterals, you know, we didn't have, and especially it's even worse, you know, if, if you're actually dealing with Kenyan investors or even banks, 
because they actually need a you know land uh, title deed you know so it's really hard to actually even when you have a solid business to actually scale up uh, that model so with the availability of recoverable grants uh, it actually opens up so much potential in, in our business you know we're able to actually you know be able to have sufficient working capital to you know to address that gap between our payables and receivables and that means we can be able to actually scale our businesses you know uh, faster and be able to maybe open you know new networks in different areas of distribution so you know we can actually be able to you know uh you know go from where we actually currently at uh 16,000 through our households with uh, solar products through our work to even probably reaching a hundred thousand uh, rural households uh, in the next three years so a recoverable grant will actually not only you know um, catalyze other investments but even as a company you know to catalyze that growth and, and, and easy scaling up so I, I would actually say that that, that is really uh, needed actually this time of you know of our growth and uh, and it's actually a little bit easier, you know, despite the collateral, but it's uh, the flexibility of terms, like the 18 months of repayment and totals up to around uh, 24 months. So with the majority of our products, we actually expect the customer to have paid within eight to 10 months. So that allows that, you know, allows us to have, to have cash to actually even buy more products. So, um, yeah, we need these recovery of grants and this uh, can actually help us scale up even in the most marginalized counties because now we are more de-risked, you know, and there's a factor of de-risking. Thanks, David. Um, really great points. Uh, ben, I, I want to go to you. Um, what, what do you think remains to be done um, and, uh, in order to, I guess, popularize uh, recoverable grants into impact funds like, like trust fund. Um, how can this become a bigger thing in, in your mind? Yeah, I think a lot of that is uh, just communication and getting the story out there. It's really important to have organizations like TEDS that can be the facilitator and manager of this for, for a, a, uh, a foundation or, or a private investor who's looking at social impact. Uh, that is so a credible qualified organization that is uh, the intermediary with the social entrepreneurs and, uh, and and has trust. But I think a lot of it's getting the story out there. There have been a, a fair amount of chat here around or some, some really good points made on the chat side around, you know, the value to an entrepreneur or the value to even a, a philanthropist or an investor of a recoverable grant versus a straight grant versus a loan or, or we didn't talk about equity for an investor it's nice to have this in the toolkit. It is, if you have two and two social entrepreneurs with the same level of social impact in your mind, then the recoverable grant is better than uh, a straight grant for you as an investor, because you can multiply, you can get the multiplier effect. You may have two social entrepreneurs, one that is, you think super high impact and one that's a little less impact and you have limited money, you might want to do just a straight grant to the super high impact because that's a, what they are doing is so compelling to you as a philanthropist. So it's really valuable, I think, for people who care about supporting social entrepreneurs to have it in the toolkit as one option, for, you know, for different situations. Another point was just made for an entrepreneur, they might prefer the recoverable grant because it helps build a credit history and has other value. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that it, for a, 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 a you know, someone with a, I have a foundation that, I, that that's where this uh, support comes from for me to have it in the toolkit. So for across a range of circumstances or a range of giving or financial support, you can pull it out to make that effective and to get more people interested in using that in the toolkit, articulating the value proposition and how it fits in that toolkit um, is valuable. And so the work that Ted does in that in getting out and seeing uh, foundations and, and, and philanthropists is really important. I think having the Miller Center or other organizations that have that level of credibility and that profile globally is super compelling and makes it easier for a philanthropist to get involved in thinking about this, um, this type of, of security and where it fits in their overall uh, profile of, of supporting social entrepreneurs. So for me, it's a lot of communication and, and strong execution. I think the more proof points the entrepreneurs we have here and, 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 and more broadly that uh, the trust fund is, is working on impacting. The more you can, we can create case studies and show um, 
philanthropists and, and foundations how this works and how effective it is and where it will fit in their toolkit when it's better for the entrepreneur when it's not when it's better for them uh, given their you know budgetary constraints as a foundation or or um or a private philanthropist or investor so i, I a lot of its communication and, and demonstrating proof points that's great ben uh, thank you there's a there's a really excellent discussion going on in the chat and i hope you all um, have been following along i want to in the time that we have left um hit on some of the key points here so Ted, I'm wondering, can you explain the difference here between um, our, the, how we're funding this with recoverable grants as opposed to um, loans and then writing off those loans? Um, and in that, potentially, you can also comment on on the use of, of loan guarantees um, in, in the capital stack as well. Sure, sure. You know, I, I, I think the big point that I'd like to convey here is that uh, investors have a tremendous amount of control and, you know, their expectations for return will ultimately dictate um, which social enterprises are able to grow and which ones aren't. And I think, you know, historically, there's been this big battle where social entrepreneurs say, that um, they can't find access to capital. They can't find capital to grow their enterprise. And investors say they can't find good enterprises to fund, right? And I think that there needs to be an acknowledgement that a lot of the work being done on the ground by David, by Manka, and by all of their peers is incredibly challenging work that um, may never, uh, is unlikely to ever be very profitable. <laughs> But that doesn't mean that it's not desperately needed. Um, and here is a tremendous opportunity for impact investors to efficiently use their philanthropic capital, support social enterprises like Manka's and David's, and get almost all of their money back. Um, there's, um, there are models that already exist. Uh, MCE social capital being a great example of um, how philanthropists can use um, their endowments to guarantee uh, guarantee loans. And then uh, uh, on an annual basis, uh, in the case of MCE, they have over 130 in, uh, investors who've each guaranteed a million dollars. And every year, any losses that the portfolio experiences, each investor shares pro rata in those losses um, in the form of a donation. So that's a powerful way that you can use philanthropy as first loss guarantees, but also to spread the loss just as we've done with um, with the trust fund. You know, if one if a single loan uh, of ours winds up paying zero back to us and all the other borrowers uh, pay in full, um, our investors will each receive over 85% of their money back. Um, and so for a very small check, uh, we we uh, we will have made uh, loans, uh, over $800,000 in loans to social enterprises, keeping most of them open. And, and that's a key point um, for people to think about. Uh, we, we chose to model this with a 2% management fee that is paid by the investors. There's no reason why we couldn't have done this without a management fee and just charged our borrowers more. Uh, but under the circumstances of COVID, we thought that this was uh, the right structure. Trust Fund 2.0, which will be making bounce back loans, will um, will have a 5% interest rate that we'll be charging borrowers. We'll be looking for um, borrowers that have weathered COVID and now with some capital will be able to bounce back uh, and return to the stages that they were at in 2019. Um, and we're expecting to raise substantially more money than we did for the emergency loan fund. Uh, but there are plenty of um, options available, beneficial returns, our model um, lending to growing social enterprises uh, during normal times. Um, has our investors uh, receive, uh, they re receive principal repaid to them, one seventh of the principal um, every year over a seven year period. Uh, we don't charge a management fee, and nor do they uh, participate in any loan losses because we have our own balance sheet to protect them. So um, in that case, investors are just told that they're lending us money at 0%, uh, 
uh, and permitting us to make high impact loans in Southeast Asia and Latin America. Thanks, Ben. Um, so we are out of time. There's a lot of great um, questions in the chat that, that we unfortunately won't have time to get to, but I would encourage you all to, to get in touch. Um, I'm posting in the chat here the link to the Trust Fund's website where you can learn more. Um, I believe, Ted, your contact information is also listed there. If not, uh, please, please be in touch um, via the, the SOCAP um, platform. We're, we're happy to, to kind of talk about these things more. We, we are very passionate about, about this mechanism um, and about popularizing uh, recoverable grants in order to um, support social enterprises in the midst of middle um, that are, as David said, um, zebras rather than unicorns. And I think this is a mechanism that, that could unlock a lot of support for them. Um, so thank you all for joining. Thank you all for, for being interested. Um, please feel free to be in touch and engage in the conversation uh, moving forward. And also let me thank um, Ben, David, Monka, and, and Ted um, for, for participating and um, for all the great work that they do um, outside of this session as well. So um, thank you all. Um, and please stay in touch.